coming guys. Um, I've been away for three weeks and Siobhan's done all the hard work with the rest of the guys here so this entire week up and I've just chimed in and um, take all the glory. So thanks to Siobhan, the crew, for getting it all going. Um, I'm presenting on life cycle assessment and when uh, we first decided to do these courses, actually Mark came in and said, I want to see shop and all. Uh, so I retitled my presentation to a revolution in building design, which, look, to be honest, I think it kind of is. And I believe that's what life cycle assessment is to the built form. We're now moving from traditional ways of improving and optimising. I think life cycle assessment really is the next, the next thing. Um, just quickly, who and what we do here at Pierce Street. Um, we're quite fortunate to move into to Mark's office with Cumberland Engineering. So we've got Cumberland Engineering, Architecture Collective, who are a really progressive um, bunch of architects, and Green Gurus, who come from a property and real estate background, and obviously ourselves with a life cycle assessment. So we're pretty much able to offer people anything they need when it comes to the built form, and, and, and our focus is obviously sustainability, and we're very passionate about what we do. Um, Having, oh, there's a duck in the house. Uh, we're having some networking drinks on Friday at 4 o'clock, so um, if you know anyone who wanted to be here who couldn't get here or, you, or you'd like to meet some of the other guys in the team, please feel free to drop by and come back. So my background, um, I'm a mechanical engineer. I moved into renewable energy kind of as soon as I could. I wanted to do it at university, but there wasn't anything you know, available at that stage. Um, and I think my first exposure to the concept of life cycle assessment was working up in the Kimberleys. I did a lot of work up there putting in solar PV systems and um, I was at Broome one day at the pub telling people about what I did and this, this, this guy said, oh, there's more energy that goes into making a solar panel than it will ever produce in its lifetime, so it's not a, good, it's not a sustainable product. And I got to admit at the time I didn't have an answer for it. I kind of felt he was wrong, but I didn't know. And uh, I was pretty perplexed, went home the next day, got up in the morning, jumped on Google, did a bit of research, and yeah, look, sure enough, when they first started producing solar panels in a commercial nature, um, it was true, you know, they didn't last very long, plus there was a huge amount of energy and, and materials that you know, into building these things. Fortunately now, it's far, far better, we're much more efficient in producing them, they're, they, they're much more efficient in operation and they last longer. So now you're looking at about one to three years to pay off those embodied impacts of producing in the first place. And I guess that got me thinking about this whole concept of life cycle assessment, embodied impacts of a product. So that's exactly what life cycle assessment is. It's sort of an accounting method or a, 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 an analysis method that follows a product or a process um, and, un, and, and analyzes every single impact um, all the way through from, from what they call cradle to cradle. Um, it's sometimes called cradle to grave if that product doesn't actually get recycled. Cradle to cradle takes it from extraction out of the ground all through its process and lifespan and feeding it back into the food chain, so to speak. Cradle to grave if it doesn't get recycled, it just gets dropped in landfill. So that's what life cycle assessment is. To give you a bit of perspective of, of you know how important life cycle assessment can be. Sorry, Alex. Yeah. Move your mouse. It's showing. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Just move it off to the side. Sorry. Yeah, there you go. Why That's not? great. There you go. So, a bottle of water, a one litre bottle of water, is about responsible for around one to two kilograms of carbon dioxide by the time that water gets into your mouth. The same amount of water, or if you get it out of the tap, the same amount of carbon or energy will give you about a thousand litres of water. Um, the obvious question is why? So when you start with a bottle of water, you start with the raw extraction of the petroleum. You've got to suck that stuff out of the ground or out of somewhere in the Gulf of Mexico. We won't mention environmental issues with that sort of stuff. But if you're purely looking at energy here, you've got to get that stuff out of the out of the oil, out of the ground. You then got to transport that oil to, to, to processing plants, turn it into some plastic. You then expand a, a bottle out of it. Um, you then have to go get some water, and typically it's going to come from some spring somewhere in the magical valley with, with butterflies and, and rainforest, and you truck that water somewhere, and you probably process it anyway, and then put it in that lovely bottle. You'll then put a lovely shiny wrapper around it. You're going to do some marketing, so you'll, you'll burn a bunch of energy doing marketing and advertising. 
then you put that stuff on a truck, or probably a boat, depending where it's come from, send it to another country, put it on a truck, send it to a warehouse somewhere where it's going to be stored. There's probably lights in that warehouse. You then take it out, put it in another truck, send it to a retailer. You might then put it in a fridge for you, and then you take it out of that fridge and you drink that water. Generally, throw it in the bin, uh, and ends up in a big pile of plastic in India somewhere. So that's the life cycle. Hopefully, it gets recycled and back into the, the, bottom, the bottom water process. Um, if you to look at the tap water in, this, in WA in Perth, we've obviously got a desal plant, we've got a dam, and we've got Nangara Mount. So there's all you know, desal's obviously got processing. Um, energy, you then got pumping and or, or, or treatment and then pumping and then you've got all the embodied energy of the pipes and the infrastructure to get it all the way through to your tap and, and into. So if you were to try and represent bits of carbon along the, on, along the way of all these things, you can see the one on the left has got massive amounts of carbon uh, and the one on the right is nothing. So scaringly enough, well not scaringly, but interestingly, a one litre bottle of water, if you, go to, if you go to a petrol station and buy that litre of water and drink it, that one kilogram of carbon is about the same as you running around for three months turning off all your standby power. So all that hard work that people do running around turning standby power, if you forget to take your, your own bottle of water and you're in the county, you just grab one from the supermarket, you've just done that all your good work. So a bit depressing, but on the flip side, the nice thing about it is that once you understand this stuff, you can work out where it have really big impacts, and one of them is to not drink bottled water, but there's obviously a bunch of other things you can do. So depressing, but also very enlightening, and, and, and allows us to do some pretty impressive stuff. So if you were to take that theory and apply it to the built environment, so you know, building infrastructure, roads, houses, whatever, you start with the materials, you've obviously got the extraction of that material out of the ground, so maybe we'll follow this through with saying, oh, no, you've got to dig that out of Pilbara, Process it, put on a boat, send it to Peninsula China, get it to a manufacturer who turns it into a building product. That will then come back to Australia probably by a ship, and then might get off the ship onto a boat, or tr oh, sorry, off the ship onto a truck, or potentially a train, sent to a, a third party as a wholesaler, and then ultimately to your building site. Once it's at the building site, you've got to assemble this stuff, so there's a bunch of assembly energy that goes to sticking all those individual building materials into something that we call a building. Um, you then have to operate that building. Now this is typically where all the focus is when we talk about sustainable design is in this operational phase. So that's the amount of energy that is required to run that building, for instance. Um, you then have maintenance throughout the design life of the building. So obviously, depending on how long the building lasts and what it's been built from, there's going to be a substantial amount of energy to keep that thing functional over its design life. Then ultimately, and hopefully, it's disposed of in a cycle and put back into that material food chain um, and we start again. So I guess if we were to compare business as usual type analysis when we look at the design, it's only that one element, that operational energy element that we've been looking at. What we have decided to do is life cycle assessment, which as I said is the revolution in sustainable design is to look at all those other aspects and really understand what the environmental and cost impacts of your design decisions are and understand them over the full design life of the building. So that's a life cycle assessment. To give you a quick idea of, of, of how important it is, a typical building will generally sit at about 33% embodied impacts, so that's that materials and transport and so on, and the operational energy impacts are about 67%. Put that into perspective, if you were to say looking at heating and cooling, you know, it's typically what we really focus on is heating and cooling, especially in residential, that's about 22% of the full life cycle perspective. So the embodied energy is actually have a bigger impact than the heating and cooling loads of the building over its design life. So a really, really important thing to do is to complement your solar passive design principles with an understanding of materials and transport and assembly. Now, I guess that, that leads me to this one, which was a lot of sustainable design is, is, is kind of missing the wood for the trees. And what I mean by that is people focus on little things a lot of the time. For instance, the solar panels. Yeah, if you didn't do life cycle assessment, you wouldn't be aware as to whether that was a good product or not. And you're surprised how many people will still say to me, oh, they hit me with the same thing when we're working on a project. Oh, I don't think solar panels are that good. And you go, well, actually, they are. They pay themselves off after a year. 
they last 25 years, or maybe 30, they'll pay themselves off and they get, okay, now I'm comfortable, let's go with it. Another good example. Uh, that's in terms of their life cycle energy. They pay them, that's their pay carbon. Back period, yeah. Whereas, and their capital investment payback is something like different. Different, different story, yeah. yeah. Looking at the environmental impact. So I'll move to life cycle costing as well, because it's another very important aspect of what we do with life cycle assessment. The two things have to go hand in hand. So um, the other one, a good example is you know thermal mass. People will say, look, I'm going to put in graphics and uh, concrete slab to get my thermal mass up to increase or decrease the requirement for my air conditioning. Unfortunately, at the same time, they're responsible for a huge amount of carbon to the embodied impacts of that concrete. So, um, it's a really life cycle assessment is a really nice way of, of, of not missing the wood for the trees, not getting bogged down in small details while missing the elephant in the room. Now, the other really, really important aspect of life cycle assessment, which I find really exciting, is what we call functional unit. Um, as the name would suggest, functional unit looks at a product and says what is its purpose, what is its function. So a good example is coffee machine. You've got two coffee machines here. The one on the left, if you were to do an environmental analysis, oh, okay, well it's quite small, it's <coughs> produced, so I didn't actually take that much energy and carbon to get that coffee machine into my kitchen at home. The one on the right, stainless steel, huge amount of energy, huge amount of carbon to get that thing to the cafe. So you might go, oh, the one on the left is far better than the one on the right. You'd be a hang on a bit, what about the function of these two things? Well, obviously their function is to make cups of coffee. The one on the left is not going to make very many cups of coffee before it falls over and dies. The one on the right is going to probably make a thousand times as many more cups of coffee as the one on the left. So the important thing to analyse here, if you're interested in carbon, you'd say, okay, we have to look at how many kilograms of carbon per coffee cup. That will give me a fair comparison of those two products. If you don't do that and you only look at carbon, you go one on the left better than one on the right. But the functional unit helps us determine what's really the best product here. Now the same, exactly the same thing applies for buildings, life cycle assessment of buildings for the building form. They all have a function. So a house's function is to have happy residents, mums and dads and kids living comfortably in the building and feeling happy and nice and comfortable. And offices, obviously, how many people can I fit into this office that are comfortable? The bridge might be how many people or how many trucks or cars pass over that bridge. So they all have a function. And the reason that function or unit is so important is because, take for instance the one on the left, that might be almost a carbon neutral building. You know, they might have built it all recycled materials, it might have a, a, a nice solar system on the top of the roof, um, super high efficient energy air, air conditioning, and so on. But there's only one person working in there. Now the one on the right might have only got a five-star performance. Um, they might not have any solar PV. They might have only used a bit of recycled materials. But if they've got a hundred times more the occupants in there, all that embodied energy, all those embodied impacts are spread over a hundred people. So that is a, a really critical component of life cycle assessment, and a really important and fun aspect of life cycle assessment that helps us optimise what we're doing in, in designing the built environment. The other aspect, I guess, of sustainable design, and you probably, have you seen this Venn diagram of sort of explaining what sustainable design actually means? Because I think a lot of the time people focus on environmental responsibility when they talk about sustainable design. I'm actually sort of trying to move away from the word sustainable because I think people always associate it with environmental and they think oh, I've got a sustainable outcome if it's carbon neutral or if it doesn't use any water. However, if it's incredibly expensive to build, yes, you might have something that's environmentally responsible, but no one else can repeat that building. No one can afford that building. So that's not sustainable. Um, you might be able to build something that is carbon neutral, has its own rainwater tanks, um, and it was very cost effective. It might even be cheaper to build than business as usual. However, if it's a really ugly building, or uh, it doesn't function well, like the, the, the internal spaces haven't been designed well by an architect and the doors bang into each other, well, you've missed the social component. Or you may have picked the wrong density, you've gone and stuck a, 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 you know, a detached house where it should be high rise. Well, it's not socially responsible. So again, you've missed sustainability. So I think what we do with life cycle assessment and life cycle costing is tackle the environmental and the economic components. There's obviously a lot of crossover because if you get the economics right, then it's also fairly socially responsible because people can afford it and that helps 
with, with housing affordability and so on. But again, it's really important that in sustainability we move away from this idea that we think it's all about the environmental and start building in these other elements of what we do. And again, that's exactly what life cycle assessment's about. It's about looking at all of the elements that go into the build form, um, analysing them all together, being able to optimise and look at trade-offs between one and the other, and quantify what we do. Um, I think for too long, people in sustainability haven't been tasked with actually quantifying what they're doing. You can say, oh, well, I've got a low carbon building. Well, show me the numbers, you know, show me what it really is. And I think that's what life cycle assessment definitely does and allows us to get the lowest cost option and the best environmental impact, or the lowest environmental impact at the same time. So what I'm going to do now is run through, I guess, some, some of the, the guidelines or ideas surrounding life cycle assessment, how we can use life cycle assessment to improve the way we build. So the first thing that we say is make it financially attractive. Again, there's no point in building a, the best environmentally friendly house if it costs the earth and no one can repeat what you do because it isn't going to be taken up on mass. It's still only going to be for the high end of town. So we really try and push people and our clients to work out how to do this in, a, in, in an economically viable method. The next biggest element is designing to make things last, design for the future. It's a scary figure in Australia is that the average residential building is lucky to get past its 40th birthday. And we're just chatting vaguely about this this morning just before, where you build attached houses and as density from the inner city starts to move out, they're knocked down and rebuilt with a slightly higher density. And then another 40 years down the track, knocked down at even higher density. So there's a real problem. 90% of the houses are knocked down for redevelopment. They're not knocked down because they're falling down. We have this misconception that we must build from double brick and tile because that's a durable material. In reality, none of those buildings will hit their design line. They won't fall over, they'll be knocked over. But they get knocked over because they're not fashionable, which is another massive issue. And I'm probably jumping through a slide of, I guess I've talked about this planning and density already, which is understanding, think what's going to be there in 50 years' time and try and design accordingly. Think about what people are going to want. You know, you might like this style of building because you saw it in a fancy magazine and it, it, it hits the fashion. Um, but what are other people going to think of that once you've moved out? Are they just going to knock it down and we do it because the land value is good, but your building isn't? And they'll start again. Um, um, there's a bit of a, an issue with the images on the video. Could you come out to it and go back into your slideshow? I can. There's Sorry, just like a plain black line on the. You want me to close the whole show no, down? No, you just go back into that Tang's character one. That'll just, just take a few seconds to Yeah, that's fine. Thank Fantastic. You. Okay, yeah, look, Tyler's character is a really hard one to, to quantify. I guess it's probably the hardest one to quantify when it comes to life cycle assessment, but an incredibly important thing. And again, it's, it's do you design for the fashion of the day or do you design for something that really will look good? And I mean, travelling around Perth, you can see which ones have been designed well and which ones haven't and which ones are going to last for a while and which ones haven't. And I guess that's it's an incredibly important aspect because obviously if you can get a building to last twice as long, you've halved all those embodied impacts in the initial build for the construction. Um, build with quality. It's quite an obvious one. You know, obviously build it energy efficient. You make it comfortable, make it functional. Um, use quality materials, use quality tradespeople. A quality building, and you, you always know, I mean, real estate agents will tell you the same thing, you walk into a quality building, you go, yep, I like this house. If you walk into a building that's already starting to crack, or the materials are fading, you go, oh, maybe we should knock this one over and start again. So again, you know, the, the quality aspects it, 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 it is, is massive. Now, I've already talked about functional unit, and so this is an obvious one. Make the thing functional. Don't build it in, with, you know, to house one person. Build accordingly. So if you know you've got a bridge to build and you only know it's going to be used once a week, build it out of materials and with a design that's suitable for that purpose. Um, same with the office buildings. That the more you can get people to use this stuff, the more functional you can make your designs and your planning and your infrastructure, the more utilisation all those materials are going to get. So again, a, a very important aspect is the functionality. 
quality, not quantity. Now this is quite funny because I was I've just come back from Europe and um, they don't really suffer from this, especially not in London. We in Australia do, on the other hand, our average residential building, 240 square metres. Scary that we have grown in the last 20 years. The average house has grown 40% in size. In the same period, we've reduced occupancy by 10%. So they're now 40% bigger, but we've got 10% less people living in them. The funny thing is, we talk about housing affordability. Well, like 40, 20 years ago, 1990, I thought our houses were massive then. So I would suggest if we just looked at reducing the size of the houses, we'd probably help out with the housing affordability quite considerably and work out how to get more people in them and, and uh, make them comfortable. Long avoided energy materials, well that's quite obvious you know, from, from what we just went through before with life cycle assessment. There's obviously certain materials that are going to have higher embodied <coughs> impacts than others. I mean, take for instance recycled timber is going to have a low embodied energy than, say, a stainless steel. Obviously, you need to pick a material that's fit for purpose for its function in the, in the construction, um, but there's some really good choices you can make to just easily reduce the embodied impact of the materials you use. And think about that cradle to cradle. Think about where it came from, how it was manufactured, how it was transported, how it was assembled, how long it might last, what sort of maintenance might be required for that stuff. Um, three R's. Reduce, reuse, recycle, which we kind of see everywhere when it, when it comes to being sustainable. The same system applies to the built environment. Reduce what you need. You know, there's a lot of redundant building materials that go into our designs. Um, and, and quite often that's one of the first places we start to say, okay, what well, are all those elements required to make this building functional and to make it beautiful and to make it, to make it last? Um, use raw finishes. I mean, we love what we've got here. Pull up the carpets and get the floorboards back, back to life. Um, carpets, when you first build, carpet isn't that big as a component of environmental impact. But as the building's going to be there for 100 years, that carpet could be replaced every five years, so 20 years. So suddenly carpet stacks up. Same with the paint. Um, paint and plaster versus a, you know, exposed uh, wall material. Probably every ten years, five to ten years, again you're going to be repainting and, and potentially replastering. And paint itself, when you start, is about 0.2% of the embodied carbon. And we talk about carbon as an impact. Um, but if it's 100 years and it's done 10 years, that's 10 times. So 0.2 becomes 2%. So you're talking about livability. You're talking about all those things in your, your diagram before that people would like to. You know, not everyone's going to want to live in a, a room that's there's a concrete feeling or True. Yeah, exactly. And, and the nice thing, I guess, with life cycle assessment, there isn't one answer. You don't say you can never ever use paint. Mm -hmm. It's, yep, there's certain times where paint and plaster is fantastic, there's certain times when double ring tiles are fantastic. But the idea is you use sort of this concept to go, okay, well, if I am going to paint, where am I going to put it? You know, where does it best get used to lives? You know, how much impact will it make on the appearance, on the feel? How happy will these people? How many more people am I going to get into that building because I've painted plaster? And that's, I guess, the way to look at what we do with, this, with these aspects. Um, reuse whatever you can. Obviously, there's an existing building there. Try and recapture all the materials, uh, anything that can be uh, put back into the building. And then look to recycle. So whatever you're building, think about what's going to happen in 100 years' time. Are those materials potentially recycled and what can you do with them when you finish? This is a really fascinating one, the, the, the transport component of materials, because you often would think using local is, is the best. And look, in most circumstances it is. In some circumstances it's not. And a good example um, is material that's put on a ship versus material that's put on a truck. If you were to take steel from China and put it on a boat and bring it to the Fremantle and take it to your building site, in Perth, um, it's going to have less impact than the transport of that material from Newcastle on a truck, purely because shipping is so efficient compared to flatbed trucks with diesel. Um, so sometimes local, but not always, is, is I guess the point to be made there. Do it once and do it properly. I guess this relates to, to, to the quality of your build. I mentioned the quality of your trade stuff. Um, but build things to last. You know, unfortunately, we're sort of in an age of consumerism and um, replacement all the time, and, and it's amazing what you can do with just building stuff that is built well and, and built um, durable. 
climate sensible. This is, I guess, the one that is obvious and that we're doing quite well at the moment in progressing this building uh, it, it, in a style that suits the climate that we're in. Perth has got one of the best climates in the world, for solid passive design, um, and done well, you can, you can create a, a sustainable outcome. You know, eight, eight stars and above for residential is quite achievable now in Perth without that much hassle. Um, hot water, not so relevant, I guess, for, for your commercial buildings, but definitely in residential and, and where, where a lot of people come unstuck with their designs is that they leave this to the end. They think, oh, hot water is something we do at the end. They've run out of budget and they'll just sort of business as usual, gas storage or whatever into the building. Now, the sad thing here is they would have invested a huge amount of time, um, energy and money on getting their design correct and have a great outcome and then go and ruin it by putting a clunky old hot water system on. And so what we always say with life cycle assessment is get all of this stuff in the design concept. Understand what your priorities are and how it sits and how it will impact your environmental outcome and make sure you don't wait till the end and say, okay, now we'll do the hot water system. Oops, we don't have the hot, we don't have the budget for the solar. Appliances and other stuff. Look, collectively this is where the biggest impact your, your operational energy is, and again, you once you move, say, from an eight star, if you move from a six star to an eight star, and I'm talking residential here, if you had an eight star and you went, I'm going to put a second fridge in there, you'll have a higher carbon footprint than if you had a six star house with one fridge. So again, don't leave it all to the end and then just go fill things up with inefficient appliances. And exactly the same way thing with commercial buildings, we find as people will not look at the entire design, not look at all the elements of the design with a life cycle assessment. They'll have a brilliant um, building envelope and then ruin it with poor efficiency appliances. Renewable energy, now I guess um, this is where my background was. I'm very passionate about energy efficiency and demand side management. Um, and when I first started, it was always you must do energy efficiency first, do whatever you can, spend everything you can on energy efficiency, and then your renewable energy is the last thing you do. Well, that might have been the case 10 years ago with the price of, say, solar PV where it was, but the cheaper it gets, the more it starts to compete with certain energy efficiency options. So there's plenty of times where you go, all right, well, no, it's not worth putting in maybe the double glazed windows, it's cheaper to put in more solar PV and offset that air conditioning bill. Um, and offset that air conditioning cost. Not only will you save money, but you'll have a better environmental outcome. But again, it's about optimising. It's not solar is better than double glazed, or double glazed better than solar. It's always sources of causes. And I guess, again, that's what this is always about, is putting it all into the mix and understanding what's going to give you the best return environmentally um, and economically. So the human element, which is a lovely one, which I guess is something that modelling and e-tools and software will always struggle with. But understanding how people will behave in the building, because as you probably all know, you can build a 10 star building, but if you put people in that don't understand how to use it, you're not going to get a good outcome. Um, there's obvious things that you can do, and, and typically it's, it's accepted that you put in real time energy monitoring um, and display it, and people know what they're doing. You generally get about a 10% reduction in energy consumption. Low carbon doesn't always mean sustainable. Well, we started with life cycle assessment <coughs> focusing on energy and carbon because that was our background. But life cycle assessment is not just about energy and carbon. There's plenty of other environmental impacts that buildings have. Um, so I mean, you might have a carbon neutral building, but if you've had to chop down a rainforest in Malaysia to get the timber, which has a low embodied energy, and you've destroyed a whole heap of orangutan habitat, that's not sustainable outcome. So really, life cycle assessment looks at a whole bunch of environmental impact categories all at the same time and allows you to optimise. I mean, it's very hard to trade between carbon and orangutans, but theoretically that's what it's about. And a good life cycle assessment tool will enable you to do that. It will enable you to understand, okay, well, I'm going to reduce my carbon, but I've had to destroy some more ecosystem. What do I, you know, what's the outcome I'm looking for here? So there are the sort of basic life cycle assessment design principles. What I'm going to do now is just go through a few case studies, um, which might be rather interesting. This is one of the first uh, life cycle assessments we ever did, which is of a set of townhouses down at uh, White Gum Valley in the Fremantle. It was quite fortunate. It was our first one, but it was, often, it was actually one of the best ones we've seen. 
the great thing that they had here was a detached, old detached building there, um, a condemned building. They had everyone around, they had everyone else around this building detached houses, and they went, no, they're going to build four townhouses with adjoining walls. So straight away, planning and density was good. So as the density moves out from Fremantle, developers will be picking off those detached houses first and putting townhouses on them. So these ones, we had a design life on this at 115 years, which doesn't sound like much, but it's two and a half times longer than the average Australian residential building, which is fantastic. They then um, recycled everything in that building. How did they come up with that? This is great. Design life algorithms. What I what I can do Mark, is um, show you if you want to have a look at the software later on. We'll show you the design life algorithms and how we got them because it is it's probably probably one of the more qualitative components of life cycle assessment. Uh, life cycle assessment is understanding, trying to understand the design life of a building. But essentially, it's a number of things. It's density. So the density that you've built compared to the surrounding density that you're in. Mm -hmm. It's adjoining walls, because um, like it or not, if you have adjoining walls, developers have to own all of them before they can knock them down. There's more qualitative components too, though, and there are things like quality of build. It's very hard, because one architect will tell you that their building is better than the other building, um, and a spec home builder will say, no, my spec home building is as good as the architect's building. So they're very hard to quantify, but you need to do it, because if you don't, have a go at it, you're, you're missing out on what life cycle assessment's about. But I'll maybe come back to it, maybe afterwards I'll, I'll show you through how those algorithms work. Um, and and we, by the way, you can manipulate that if you're not happy with the design life. You can say, no, I think my building will last 300 years, and you can you can play around. That's the other really exciting thing. Um, with life cycle assessment, you can do sensitivity analysis and say, well, look, what happens if we do manage to get it to last an extra 100 years? How does that impact it? Or no, we're on a mining camp, we're only going to get 10 years out of these things. You drop it to 10 years, and you'll suddenly find that your material selection should change because you don't want to be building out of heavy, durable materials. So they get a great design life. They use a lot of recycled materials, earth care and developers, and apart from the uh, landscape architects, they have a building recycling business. So they take building waste and turn it back into materials. So a lot of recycled stuff went into this, a lot of local materials. The operational energy was really good, the good thermal performance, good hot water selection, and solar PV renewable energy, and a bunch of other things. So as a result, they had a great outcome for, for a building. The nice thing too for these guys is um, they got fantastic prices. They sold all of these in a very tough market, um, and they got a really good outcome for them. They are a high-end product too, by the way. This wasn't a this wasn't a cheap job, but um, clean up with the awards, really up to the hell of a lot of awards. Yeah, they're so. Shortlisted for the national standard. Yeah. So that's another bit of results. Yeah. The the interesting thing though is that they. Woo! <laughs> in fair, that's where we should all be going. Yeah. <laughs> they um when they initially went to sell the, the real estate agent they initially page didn't understand sustainability and they couldn't sell them. They moved to another real estate agent, um, who I know personally, who understood and could explain and communicate the concepts behind this, sold them all. So, you know, we often talk about us being technically based and we can help you get a great outcome, but you still need people that can communicate and understand what they're doing. Um, two Wong Street, this is just up in Bayswater, um, a great example of, of recycling what you've got. They had a California bungalow, and instead of knocking it down, they just put a new roof on it and chuck it, chuck it around out the back. They subdivided, so they increased their density. So it really um, saved a lot of materials that went into it, managed to increase the density, got a more um, modern house, I guess. Um, a nice solar PV system, a nice solar hot water system, and a bunch of energy efficient appliances that went into that. So a really good outcome, probably one of the best outcomes we've had is through renovation rather than starting again. So that's the nice thing about life cycle assessment is you're able to determine, should I knock it over and start again, or should I um, renovate? What will give me a good economic outcome or give me a good environmental outcome? The Green Swing Project, you guys familiar with this one? It's a really cool project, um, big park, or it's a big park, that's land. Who's the architect? Who's the architect? It was um, solar building, so designed with Morris. Um, I mean, they had a huge input into what they did here. Um, 
a, a very nice social project, I guess, as well. Three couples are really good friends who, who wanted to live close to the city but couldn't find anything that was what they wanted at a affordable price. And went, right, well, how about we all build on the same block? So there's three houses on here. The, the cool thing is, one's a straw bale, one's a reverse brick veneer, and the other's a double brick. So you have three completely different styles of building, all in the same spot. And we got really excited because now we had the ability to see what's going to work. The nice thing is, they all worked, which is what I'm talking about before. There isn't one thing. It's like no paint or no double bricks. There are. There's always a way of making things work. Obviously, some things are are easier than others, but if you have intelligent design and a bit of forethought behind what you're doing, you will get a good outcome. And obviously they got good outcomes also by being quite dense for the area that they're at, um, quite small buildings, um, and much they're very good on the operational energy side too. They so build on the same side all at the same time, that's probably the, the core side. The helping, yeah. Even though um, there's such disparate uh, trades going on. Yeah. It's the same so thing. They're doing a bit themselves. Yeah. So but you can't, there's no problem with getting trades in the moment building it as well. And housing industry. But if they're all just coming in to do little bits and yeah. get them yeah. up all that. It's a fascinating project. If you note know it down, they've got a great website. They're doing ongoing updates of how they're going and they love to share their information. How they, did they own the building? And the the straw bale, they have. I'm not entirely sure what they've done with the double brick or the was. Like Right homes, right homes yeah. have done all the buildings that built for all three, I thought. The years, but they, the, the straw bale was predominantly done by Eugenie and Mark. Uh, Helmet, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, you know, you did the SC. You There's a lot of elements, we'll, we'll get back to it. There's a lot of elements that are identical in each building. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's complex. The timber frame roof, there's the yeah. carbon roofing, there's the. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's, there's framing, there's the whole bunch. Yeah. But, but yeah, a really yeah, interesting, interesting case study. Yeah, yeah. Definitely worth going and having a look and chatting to them as well. I think there's a lot to be learned from what they've done, you know, lessons and so on. Um, this is sort of moving up from the residential scale to, to I guess, a, not commercial, but it's a uh, sustainability learning centre over in Tasmania. And a, a brilliant outcome. A lot of recycled materials in here, a lot of low embodied energy materials. Um, Fantastic thermal performance again. Um, you can see the solar PV. So, a good mix of thermal performance, energy efficiency, renewable energy, good material selection, good design life. Again, with some intelligent design, they've pretty much ended up with a zero carbon outcome uh, without that much challenge. This is just around the corner. Um, this is probably one of the first zero or, or carbon offset buildings that we'll see going from Perth. And I think it's going to be one of the many that we see rolling through. It's been um, signed up for a while. It's going ahead. To it's going ahead. The last time I passed through, it was construction starting. Sticker was stuck across the front. So you know, look, they, they've done it very well in the marketing aspect. They've really pushed it. Um, and again, in the tough market, managed to secure the, the pre-purchase and the financing to get things up and going. Um, this was a really interesting one we did not that long ago. I guess just out of our own interest, to be honest, we wanted to see what a massive infrastructure project would look like. So the Sydney Harbour Bridge, um, when we first started pulling the stats out and trying to get it into a model, into our model, huge amount of steel, you know, 53,000 tonnes of steel, it was the biggest thing we'd ever seen. Huge amounts of concrete, huge amounts of granite, um, even the paint alone, I mean, the paint alone has a bigger impact than a few houses put together. Um, nine years to build the thing, so you can imagine the assembly, although a lot of it was done by hand, um, has a design life of about 300 years. So the cool thing is though, if you look at what it managed to achieve in terms of re reducing transport, energy and carbon, obviously before it was there, people had to travel a long way to get from one side to the other. So it offset its carbon, or its CO2 footprint, by 1955. And it's already done that another 35 times over <coughs> since then, and it's going to keep doing that. So the really exciting thing here, the nice thing here is that, yes, sometimes these infrastructure projects have huge embodied impacts, but you've done well with some forethought, good design, your net result's going to be a really positive one. Um, but yes, you have to do the life cycle assessment to understand. You also have to understand the function of, the, of what it is, and this is a bridge, and is it going to get used a lot? Yes. So it's got a great functional output, um, and away you go. 
you, I think we touched on this before was the life cycle cost and how we looked at the carbon you know, offset of the solar PV at one to three years, the financial offset, well, it depends entirely on what the government is doing to feed in tariffs, but um, you know, we're now typically talking to anywhere between six to ten years, even without rate rates, you're still around an eight year mark. So what is really important with your life cycle assessment is to do your life cycle costing <coughs> simultaneously. So your life cycle costing, your life cycle assessment for environmental impacts will tell you straight away which things should I be spending money on, which things are going to give me a return on investment financially, which things are going to give me a return on investment environmentally, and it actually helps you reduce capital outlay because you don't go spending money on things that aren't going to help you or aren't going to help the environment. And it's where we find life cycle assessment um, has a lot of quick early wins. If you get people that design concept, and this is what we really try and do with, with our clients specifically, is get them in at design concept phase. And before they've already made a decision about what things are going to look like and what sort of elements they're going to throw in there, we can sit down and say, well, look, that's not going to give you a return on investment when you put it through a life cycle costing. So they can remove certain components of the building and hence reduce capital outlay as well as improve their ongoing costs. The nicest thing to do is if one, you get a client that says, we'll do anything as long as it has a return on investment under eight years. You go, great, chuck it in the model, and here's what, here's what your, re uh, your recommendations are, what you can be doing it. And then they say, yeah, cool, we'll, we'll do things that have a 10 year return on investment if they save X amount of carbon and then maybe throw it straight through again or we'll do it if it has an improved water outcome and whatever. So you can quantify this stuff with the financial and the environmental at the same time. What's happening around the world or what's happening with life cycle assessment specifically? Um, we started in this game about three years ago and we're very new. There's been people working with life cycle assessment forever. You know, it's, it's one of those things that a lot of people, well not a lot of people, you have a brain for it, you go, I wonder where that cup came from and you start thinking it's quite scary when you start, you can't look at anything the same twice ever again. Um, so people have been doing life cycle assessment forever, you know, they'll look at a brick and they'll do a life cycle assessment of a brick and they'll understand where the clay comes from and how much transport, how much assembly and so on to get that brick together. We were one of the first to really introduce life cycle assessment to the built environment on a mass scale. Up until then, it was more of an academic concept that you would have to spend $50,000 and engage university to do a life cycle assessment of a house. We have said, right, we need to make this readily available. So we've moved it to that level. You find the big green building councils of the world, so you're probably familiar with Green Star in Australia, the Green Building Council. Um, You've got Bream over in the UK and Leeds in America and then the Germans have got their own version. I wish I won't have a crack at explaining what those words say. But um, Australia, I've just come back from, from Europe and yes, we're lagging hugely behind what everyone else is doing around the world. Um, but Green Star and Green Building Council have recognised that. So Bream and Leeds have always had a bit of life cycle assessment involved because I understand that that's where you've got to go. Brand start went right, and we're going to leapfrog that, and we're going to include a hell of a lot more. So where brand and leads sort of look at certain building elements, so you might do a life cycle assessment for the carpet, but just the carpet. Brand star have said, well, we're going to do a life cycle assessment of construction components. So you look at more of the building envelope rather than individual bits, because again, if you just look at little bits, you end up sort of missing the, the wood for the trees again, and you think you're doing the, the right thing, but you stuffed up something else in your building in order to you know, get a good carpet outcome. So Green Star is trying to look at the building, but they're not doing the whole lot. I dare say what will happen internationally is they go, okay, that's where Green Star's going, well, this is where we're going to take lead the Green and we'll move to a complete holistic perspective, which is what, what the life cycle assessment's really about. And these guys have done it. Um, have you heard of the Living Building Challenge at all? So these guys kicked out of Seattle, I believe. Don't quote me on that. Um, and they created what they've called the Living Building Challenge. And it's been around, I think, for four years now. They've really started to move it um, in the last couple of years. So I only heard about it at the beginning of this year. And what caught my eye was that they've included life cycle assessment from the beginning. So rather than where Green Building Councils are, um, where they're, I mean, they're matched. Green Building Council Australia is huge and there's a lot of people involved in Green Star. So when they make a small change, it creates a big problem for you know, people. When you've got something that big, it's hard to move it. 
So for them to move straight into life cycle assessment is very difficult, whereas these guys from day dot have got it in there. So it's a really exciting process. In fact, they kind of suggest that you, if you have a green star rated building, or in this case in America, a lead rated building, platinum, you're only just at the bottom of the living building challenge rating system. So their aim, they kind of liken themselves to a flower. A flower can take whatever it needs from its local environment, the moisture, the light, whatever it needs, pollination, and have this beautiful structure and survive and die and replenish itself. And that's how they see buildings. A building should be able to source whatever it needs locally, and that includes its energy, its water, and so on, and have no impact. In fact, it should have a positive impact on its environment. So it's a really nice concept. Um, you know, they include social elements as well. So when I say a positive impact on the environment, you know, not only should it source all of its energy uh, locally. In fact, the way they do their energy calculation is that they say, how much your roof space? So how many solar panels can you get on it? What's your wind resource like? How many wind turbines can we get? Okay, how much energy will all that produce? Okay, that's your energy budget. We now have to design a building that will only use that amount of energy. So instead of saying, right, well, let's design something and then how many solar panels do we need? They do it the other way around, which is really cool. Um, and then, you know, they looked at the elements of livability and how people interact with the building to, to create a great social space as well. So I guess they're the sort of high end of town or, or the, 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 the fancy elements of sustainable design. But the, the nice thing is it's now finding its way into basic design guidelines. So they stumbled across this one on the project we're doing with ECU. And someone threw me the design guidelines, and I was just flicking through them, expecting to see, you know, the paint colour must be this, and the roof colour must be that, and must be out of, you know, this material. And I found this stuff on embodied energy, and I went, wow, you know, this is a university that's now specking in its buildings the embodied energy requirement or the maximum embodied energy requirements you're allowed. So. I guess what I'm seeing here is when we started three years ago, it really still was quite a um, academic kind of concepts, a bit of a niche market. It's now moving incredibly rapidly, um, and, and especially globally, and now as you can see, even locally. So, do, you, do you know the story behind how it got in there? Do I personally know it? No, but I could trace some of the stuff at the bottom. I think it came from RMIT. Or, or you, do, do you, sorry, did, is there something There's you know? That, no, no. No, yeah, I knew the guy, I know the guy, um, Tim Grant. Just wondering if that's now becoming common amongst all universities. I hope so. I hope so, but um, I'm not entirely sure. Or where it's coming from, yeah. I think it, they might have had something to do. Um, the, per the person that wrote some of this stuff, I recognise his name, and I recognise where he's from, he's connected with RMIT. So, that may be where it came from. It's just that also sometimes being very specific in briefs like that can be problematic. Exactly. Well, especially if it's not quite right. And we, yeah, I guess it's the nice thing with what we do is that we don't have a rating system. We don't say you must achieve this or, or whatever. It's to use life cycle assessment to get the best outcome you can with your budget. And it shouldn't be about, right, you must achieve this thermal performance or you must have this much renewable energy or you must have this much embodied energy in the concrete, it should be put the whole thing together and look at the outcome, which if it's carbon, it's kilograms of carbon per student to university per year. So you might find that, well, look, we couldn't source fly ash concrete because we had to get it from Victoria and the transport energy was ridiculous. So we used the local concrete and yes, we didn't make this but we've offset it or we've used recycled timber or something else where we've got a global over yeah, over what do you call it? Global good. Global good, exactly. I think so that's the Would you then have any trouble with some of those figures? Or do you think as long as as long as there's some step for being able to I think so. And I think that's the nice thing. Yeah, I mean life cycle assessments been very useful um, for projects like this or where it you know, even local councils have specific requirements, and you can say, look, we didn't hit that one. And often the case, the designer goes, well, we can't hit that, and they go, we can't do it. The designer says, I couldn't hit that one, but I've done really well. Here's the numbers. Here's the science behind why I've chosen to do what I've done. We've still got a really good outcome. I mean, we had a, a residential building that got a five-star thermal performance. Now it wouldn't be allowed to be built here. Um, yet everything else you did was absolutely brilliant. So the net result for that building was far better than an eight or a nine star residential building with nothing else going for it. 
So he's able to demonstrate and say, yeah, well, look, I didn't, do it. I didn't get a six star, but my net result is fantastic. And that's that's the, the handy thing, I guess, with your, your life cycle. It's not prescriptive, we'll put it that way, which you know, I think gets us into a trouble. With a lot of rating systems, they are heavily prescriptive. You don't have the prescription, right? You don't have that six star requirement. Yes. The builders, yeah. their, great, their great thing is self-regulation, which yeah. means they'll be building tents. And then charge oh, yeah. the brick. You, you're spot on. So yeah, I'll have to have that to keep that standard as high yeah. as possible. I'm totally in support of six star and, and above. Yeah, definitely. Um, Seven's got a good ring to it. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting, like you, you with your star rating, it's just like energy efficiency, there's a point where you, there's a sort of law of diminishing returns. It gets more and more expensive and does less and less. And there's other things you can do to get better outcomes. And that's that's the way I believe sustainable design should function. Not prescriptive all the time. There should be benchmarks, and let's say a six star is a benchmark, but then above that, what can we do to get a great economic and environmental outcome? So LCA future, um, I guess for us it's about making informed decisions and, that, and that's, that's, that's what's happening with LCA at the moment. It's enabling people to say, okay, well, should I use solar panels? Oh, okay, well, we've done the life cycle assessment. Yes, for this application they're a great thing. Or no, maybe sometimes they're not. Um, you, know, you might have a building like this which is going to pop shade all the time, so no, don't put solar PV on. Um, it enables us to build more functional or encourages to build more functional buildings. So rather than building um, things with absolutely behemoth foyers with the security guard in it and then you know two offices that sit behind it and that's it, you go, okay, hey, well, the, the goal of this building is to get as many people in there as comfortable as possible, and that's what you strive for. Um, so by, by default, it's going to help construct more affordable buildings at the same time. Um, it's enabling us to, 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 to do it very easily. Um, it used to be hard to access this life cycle assessment design philosophy, but now it's not. It's a hell of a lot easier and a hell of a lot more cost efficient. And it's going to make this transition to the zero carbon world uh, a lot more easy and a lot more fun, in my opinion, anyway. We really enjoy what we do. Um, I'm sort of getting towards the end, and, and this is something I think is really important. And we, we really touched on this before this idea of prescriptive rating versus performance based design. And I think that's what life cycle assessment is about is in the pre design and conceptual design phase. You really need to be introducing this at the beginning. Um, yes, we still get engaged at the end of projects where people say, oh, come and give us an LCA rating. And you go, well, we don't do LCA rating. It's a design tool. And that's where you need to fit. Because the further you move down that path, the less positive impact you're going to be able to have on what you do. We're now at the point where we say, look, if you've got a concept or a project, come and see us. Obligation free, we'll just have a chat to you. Um, it's it's it, there's a number of great things that come out. Number one, you, you get to have an impact, you get to help optimize. Number two, the client actually gets to see whether you can provide value. Because there's some projects that we look at and go, well. Done a great job. You don't actually need us. Go for it. Um, and we don't want to be paid to get put on a project when we're not doing anything. It's much better to actually chat with people at the beginning, show them what we do, show them some examples, show them some recommendations, things that they might see with their project, and away you go. Um, so that's basically ETIL. I guess you know we created ETIL out of a need. We felt that life cycle assessment was the way forward to, to improving sustainable design. Um, we wanted to make it incredibly accessible, so we've gone the web-based bit of software, so anyone can access it. We started in the residential space because that was the first project we were ever given. We also thought that if we could make it financially viable for residential buildings, then we can easily upscale, and that's what we've done in the last, or well, since the beginning of this year, move from residential to commercial and infrastructure. So we're now getting involved with pretty much everything. Um, so as I said, uh, it, Pretty much any scale of project is uh, LCA is applicable to. It used to be about looking at cups of tea or, or bricks. Now it's moved to buildings. Now it's moved to commercial. Now it's moved. To the regional schemes have kind of gone the other way. Started in commercial projects. Yeah. Only recently heading towards right. residential. Yeah. Is residential green stuff done yet? Or no. It's still on its way. It's still conceptual. Yeah. yeah. We're only going multi-unit residential. Right. So yeah, I've got like yeah, lots of apartment buildings. Like that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, I guess there's a business model you think we'll go commercial because that's where the money is. And I think 
when we started, um, you know, we thought maybe that too. But then we, well, we, we knew we'd get gobbled up in maybe two or three projects, which meant we'd have 0.01% of of impact on the world's yeah, carbon. Yeah, I mean, the housing is massive. It is, um, yeah. Expected, but it's huge, yeah. Our biggest challenge as green, <laughs> green uh, activists, if you like, yep. is to change the business model of yes. the project builder. Yep. The, problem, the model at the moment is I build this box, I build 15 different types of boxes, I don't want to build anything else but these boxes. I don't want to change them, I don't want to move them to change unless they're made to do that. It's about oh, changing the number uh, of tastes. Yeah. It's well, interesting. It's only in response to 60% of the buyers are completely single bottom line. How much does it cost? How much does it cost? And they're driven towards it. Based model that it's going to cost them thousands to run every year. Mm. I suggest that people are actually driven by what they're shown and told. So Very you true. actually give them options that they had, you know, that just not just yeah. it's not just they'll buy. It's yeah, it's probably more of a philosophical discussion and a social based one. I agree. It's it's to do with marketing. You can take, for instance, project builders. They have the biggest budget in Australia to market. And they market what they make profit out of, so they will keep selling that and people will keep buying it. If, I mean, take for instance the house that's now grown to 240 square metres, so if it was purely about bottom line, they would say, no, I will take the architecturally designed house and I'll just take 40% off the size and I'm happy. So it's, it's, I don't think it's necessarily about bottom line, it's about what they've been sold and thrown round down their necks every time they open the magazine. And I think that's how it will change is through good communication and marketing. Uh, I think it only seems to be in Fremantle that people actually make that transition. I think it's a Looking around right. where that place is in White John Valley. Yeah. There's quite a lot of really good houses down yeah. there, and they're nice, small, and well designed. They're yeah. not built there by accident. Much around the place. Uh, they're That's not built there by accident. Alan Nelson from Earthcare, they've chosen that area very yeah. carefully because they know that the That's people who want to live in that area are environmentally conscious and they're more yeah. likely to get a buyer. Yeah. yeah, you take it up to you know, just about anywhere else. Yeah, you got the Sorrento, I don't care. So we need more passionate. We need more passionate people. Well, in saying that, Sorrento's got four of our houses. Good, <laughs> but so it, it's, it takes time. But I mean, you know, through experience, in life. So, I mean, take for instance, solar PV. Where I started, I, my first system was sold not on its economic benefit. It was sold purely on its environment. It didn't have a payback. Three years later, it had a they had pretty good economic paybacks and bang, they just explode. You look, my, my parents bought my first one, because they like me, and uh, you know, they're like, oh, we'll never pay it off, they didn't care. And the unfortunate thing is the first movers have to help drive the efficiency and the cost down and get it accepted. And a lot of it was not necessarily about the cost, it was about whose neighbour had done it. So when you see your next door neighbour with a solar PV system on, your roof, on their roof, you think, oh, it's all right, I can do one of those. And when you start seeing more and more houses, they look different. But my next door neighbour, they're a smart couple. I like her, I like him, he's a smart guy. Must be a good style of housing. I'll, you know, I'll have a go. But if you're surrounded by business as usual, it's very hard for you to think outside. The very nice doing that is, is on costs of energy, and you're seeing the people now starting to realise they have to pay so much more for energy. They look at options. And I was dealing with a woman the other day who has been out of the country for a while, so she sort of missed her for the last 10 years, and she's sort of stuck in this 90s sort of a model, and, um, and there's no way that she wanted to be pounds anywhere near her place because they're yeah. ugly. And fine, I'll put a place where she can have a later, you know, for a later date if she wants, and I'll put a position for a uh, solar hot water system, didn't reach into to her, but the other day she said, oh my God, I've just got my gas bill, it's $800, there's no way. I said, well, what about yeah, it's like, I mean, fast, I live in Strata in Leaderville, and my solar PV system got knocked out because potentially it would devalue the property. I mean, we have a 1980s brick and concrete tile building. It's not, a, well, no, it's not unattractive. Um, yeah, six months later, oh, we love solar PV, let's go for it. And they're popping up all over the place. So it's a lot about that. It's a lot about a social norm, getting people to like them, accept them. And it has to come from government, in my opinion. We've got a situation where we went five star. It took almost three years kicking and screaming to get the project builders and the NBA and the HIA to six star. They delayed, delayed, and gave excuses. Get them to six star, knowing when it did go to six star, they can do it for the same price. Yep. 
and they've all said that I'm down. And yet, to get to that next level, it's got to be driven. They've got to be legislated or yeah, it's again so very for them to start thinking outside the box. Now, oh, we have to do this. It's a very philosophical question because I, I I agree in some regards that legislation can be very useful. But I also strongly believe in a market-based approach. And if you get your marketing right and you encourage people to want it, you get there a lot quicker. Because as you said, how hard was it to fight? When you have to fight to get something, whereas if you can sell it, people will start wanting it. So easy. Trust me, the project will hope they will build eight star if the population Absolutely. starts saying, I like eight star. And why don't they want it? Because they don't know anything well, about it. They haven't the been. popularity of these uh, solar and solar and, and PV systems is so much more mainstream in the last yeah. few years. That, yeah. Um, uh, it, it's quite. It's quite amazing. It's going to be hard it's huge for the, the rebates. But if you look at the marketing, if you looked at the proportion of marketing to the purchase rates, they're almost linear. I mean, when I started, I thought marketing was to go to the local newspaper, spend 500 bucks, and put an ad all about saving the planet, and put that in there. And you know, I got three or four sales out of it. And then it was probably two years later that I remember watching on TV, and Dennis Lilly turned up selling solar, and I was like, what does he know about solar? That's not going to work. You can't sell solar panels with Dennis Lilly. I mean, he doesn't even have one on his roof, but it didn't matter. It serves as a social norm. The ladies love him, the men respect him, he's a cricketer. I'll have one of them on my roof. the other way around. Yeah. And solar, solar, solar just went through the roof. Absolutely, and, and then that gives the guys more money to do more marketing, and it just and away you go. And I think that's and where they right. dealt with uh, the volume builders as well. So yeah, I think they would work around needs or something. Yeah, like that. yeah. So, we, we had a really interesting discussion with Kiara. I don't know if you guys were here. Um, was it yesterday? Tuesday. 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 That, that was what Green Guru was all about. It was uh, I find fascinating the philosophy, the sort of the um, psychology behind. Um, you know, what drives people to buy and what, what they value. So Kiara's talk was sort of hinting at that a lot of times. She's a, a real estate agent and she's right into going and doing a master's in office at the moment. Because I just look at, you know, I, I totally agree with Alex. I think it's all, it, you need to have a market-based approach. And it's working in the commercial buildings, et cetera, at the moment. The green sales are such a big adoption in the commercial building and neighbours and all the rest, and it's completely voluntary. Yeah. You know, except for the bigs coming in now, man, for disclosure. But, yeah. um, it, it got a lot of legs to sort of off market driven yeah. approach. And, and, and I feel much more comfortable as a consultant or as a depression of going to someone and saying, well, you're doing this because you want it, not because not because I'm sort of, you know, I don't think, I don't think I'd still be in this job if I was going along to do some regulatory tick the box exercise. You know? yeah. but is, has there been a study done on what is the relative gain of a few really, really good projects or a really minor? Improvement in the basic minimum standards. Well, well, the idea though behind the whole Green Star approach was that, well, the, the, I, I don't know if there's a hard data on it, so short, short answer, I don't know. But the approach that the Green Star had was that they would only service the top few uh, percentage of the market from four star above mm -hmm. to try and sort of set a new benchmark and drive the market up from the top, I suppose you'd say, mm -hmm. which I think has been quite effective because people have got a greater awareness now. And now, I mean, I was just as a, a the guy with the new commercial office development in Belmont who would never go near Green Star, phone right up the other, the other day or, or, or neighbour around here, phone up going, oh, I think I need one of these neighbours things. I think, I think <laughs> I need, stars. I need a government tenant. I need, you know, I think I get better tenants through this. And he had no idea what he was talking about, but he, he kind of yeah. wanted it. You know, it, it was completely voluntary. Like, people are getting better tenants with this stuff. And I think we need to get that down to the residential that mentality as well. I, I find it fascinating how you got a, a bogan down in success or somewhere, and he spends like 20 grand lowering his car and putting the, putting the, 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 the thing on, his, on the back of his car, lowering his hold and all the lights that shoot downwards. And you just think, if he then goes, oh, no, solar panels are too expensive, mate. You know, <laughs> you can put them on, on the roof of his house. It's just yeah. the value that people place on things in their everyday life is completely out of whack. Uh, I mean, people say that things are too expensive for some aspects of their house, but then they'll go and waste 10 grand a year on restaurant meals and stuff. That's, right. that's a really good point. And I think that you said before that people aren't educated enough about things. We, we are building these houses at six star, and we're giving them to 80% of the population who are buying these, even the new ones at six star, and they have no idea how much it's going to cost them to run. Mm. And the low income earners, the housing commission, the, the, you know, the public housing sector, They've got no chance of paying 
the bills and so forth of those properties as it continues to rise. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think the government, that's why I, I was pushed to the government to say, well, you know, a yeah, minimum yeah. for public housing should be higher than Yeah, I think it's, a multi, choice. it's definitely a multi-pronged approach. Mm -hmm. so I agree with legislation, but it needs to be done with a hell of a lot of marketing and, and you need to sell it. Because typically what happens in Australia is the industry will be well, The market, society will, will kick it off. Uh, some smart people go, I want an eight star house and I want PV. And then the industry goes, oh, okay, well, I can do that for you. And you get a few architects and designers thinking, oh, we'll sell some of these and they work together. They get enough of them going. And then suddenly the government's like, oh, what's that? It's like, that. oh, that works, okay, well, we better regulate that. And you, you all work together. And, and that's why I don't think it's just regulate. Because if you just regulate, you would have a fight. Just, just to yeah. change some little provisions in the BCA. Um, it's just always happen <laughs> in just really small, pretty on, on a global future scale, yeah. useless steps because that's that's all. The, the government's just way too uh, conservative. So, about you're on it. video, by the way, so you need to be careful with that. that well, <laughs> uh, Jack, you're on video. Responsible governments have to be conservative. Uh, True. For, uh, to balance the interests of, uh, of the market and the yeah. Yeah. You, you find that if you, if you, in my opinion, after being for a while, it's faster. Like if you want to maximise your the return for your effort of improving design, I think it's faster for you to go out and lead by example and get people excited by what you're doing, and then you'll get people doing it, and then the government will go, oh, we'll do it now. And that's just the nature of the game, as you say. It's it's got to be responsible and follow. It looks like you get faster results out of just. Um if the right things happen in the marketplace, it yep. seems to be... Well, I would have thought of a better approach to, to regulating it rather than putting more stringent requirements in the BCA and so on and so on and, and regulate would be to actually do like what the, the government's done with the financial services industry where they've just allowed people to make better decisions. They, they've given a, a more simplified and better breakdown. So like what yeah. you were saying is before, people don't know what their life cycle cost impact is of going a house without insulation compared to with insulation or with solar panels without solar panels, and they only get shocked by the first bill. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's something fundamentally wrong if you're surprised by your first bill that comes along. <laughs> so what you should have in all our project yeah. homes is a little graph down the bottom right or whatever that goes at expected energy bills, you know, yep. expected energy bills over 10 years. Expected yep. energy bills with solar panels over 10 years, and you can compare. I was going to say, you've done your washing machine oh, right. front door as well. Are you familiar yeah. with yeah. Um, mandatory disclosure? No. So that's the, the that. disclosure of, and, and I mean, it's been on the cards for 10 years now, and unfortunately, the Kobe government cannot agree on what method to go with, and that seems to be the sticking point. But essentially, it's for any sale of a property will have its environmental standards, including energy efficiency and costs. Um, disclose at the point of sale, which will be exactly that. You know, before you buy the house, you'll be able to go, oh, okay, this is what it's at. And the nice thing again is this is a market based approach. You don't have to, when you sell the house, you don't have to go and put insulation in it and get it to a certain rating. You can sell it as is. But if you don't, you're going to be selling a house and everyone goes, oh, I've got two same houses, they're the same price from the same street. That one's eight star, that one's six. I'll take that. Thank you very that, much. That is a much better and fairer system for the buyer. Because the current scenario is the real estate agent's blur. Yeah. Says this is air conditioned with insulation. Yeah. This one's just air conditioned. Yeah. What they don't say is this air conditioner is actually a decent one and it's going to survive. This one's an old hole in the wall, 15 years old, reverse cycle, yeah. which obviously is about to die, and the insulation's 15 years old <laughs> as well. Yeah. But that doesn't give you the, the truth. Yeah, and inspected and whatever else. So. Yeah, I mean there are there are flaws with this model in that how much information do you need to provide, mm -hmm. and there is a cost associated with doing putting together that mandatory disclosure component. You need a, 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 a professional to come and analyse the building, so there is costs that are there. And then how much information do you provide? Do you have to get in the roof and check the insulation, see how much it's, it's degraded? Because if you start doing that, then you're up for a lot of money. Whereas, I mean, the Queensland model was just a really cheap and nasty check sheet. Has it got insulation? That was how simple it was. You know, if you know it, you didn't even have to say. You could say, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, and that was your outreach well, disclosure. Well, the real market like that anymore. Yeah, but that's fine. You know, I think it's, again, a market-based approach. If, if your real estate agent has the check sheet, it's like, well, I don't know. So you go, oh, okay, for the next door neighbor's house, 
has the hot water, has the solar PV, has the insulation. You're like, oh, okay, well, mm. Then suddenly the real estate actually goes, oh, I'm not going to tick the I don't knows anymore. I'm going to actually do the, do the research. And you drive it by market encouragement rather than you must well, hit you on the head until you, you know, get your star rating up. And, but yeah, you, you, you need benchmarks. Money yeah. is the best driver. What about, um, and so that's whenever a house changes hands, what about with the new ones? The same thing. So yeah, cuts have to be done. Okay. Yeah. So you'd obviously you'd obviously stay with. We've already got the VCA with you know, minimum star ratings, which is just the performance, and, and other states have various bits with hot water and so on. Yeah. You start including other aspects, so you do include solar PV, but it's not a mandatory. You must have solar PV. It's a if you've got it, use it to sell it. And that's like with that Stephen Street example, you know, perfect example of a real estate agent who knew what she was doing, knew how to sell sustainability. Yes, a perfect environment to do it in, being free-eyed, but the previous real estate agent didn't know that stuff. So didn't know how to sell it. So when people were coming through the door, you know, this girl could market the stuff and people went, wow, no, no power bills? That's brilliant. You know, they had the little graphs and everything. Obviously, we provided all that information for them, but they had it there which enable them to communicate and, and move forward. And look, if you're interested in this stuff, uh, Kiara from Green Gurus, who's part of the team, that's what she does. You know, She's from that background of real estate. To help people, if you're going to spend money on sustainability, or make sure you do it in such a way that's going to give you a return on, on your development. Um, which, you know, we, we've sort of got a strong engineering background, we love pie charts and spreadsheets and technology, um, but you very quickly realise that that ain't Going to get you anywhere until you've got Dennis Lilly on the TV. And, and, you know, so, if you ever see Dennis Lilly selling e tool, <laughs> we're you made it. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, do we need to wrap up or are we, are we able to? Well, that was a good discussion. It's a pretty yeah. small group here. I think we can just wrap up now. Yeah. yeah. Guys, do we should, you know, I'll come back if you tomorrow, but we've got Mark's presentation on at lunchtime. Are you doing a four o'clock one? Uh, yeah, and I'm giving a talk only at 12.30. Okay, 12.30. And then, and then we'll probably roll that straight into drinks. I don't think I'll be doing that. Well, well, we're starting <laughs> drinks at, at 1.30. So yeah, probably. <laughs> It'll probably be pretty casual in the afternoon. Yeah, well, theoretically, the drinks networking starts at 4. There's going to be, because we, if you, you probably were aware, there's been a um, full week of talks from Grand Gurus. Um, kind of architecture collective. So we're all going to be here on, on the Friday. Great opportunity to meet like-minded people and passionate um, uh, people mm -hmm. in the industry. And, and there's been a full mix. With, I mean, this week we've had everything from mums and dads through to the state government, um, building developers, financial groups, everything in between. So That's nice. That's lots of architects here. Yeah. Yeah. It's been great. It's um, well, and I congratulate all of you here for the Peace for Collective because it's it's. Enlightening, but it's very informative. But it's also really refreshing to see people from different um, aspects of, of the same sort. Of, everybody's at the same goal. Yeah. We, my industry at least, and I'm in the building industry for the last thirty odd years. Everybody's about this. Yeah. And you, know, when you get offline, talk green, they whack you on the head, and bring you back in, and say, "What are you doing? Just get back and build the box." Yeah. And until you start to get people from different um, professions. Yep. Um, you don't see that collective oh, that's a good word. Yeah. collective result that gives you the right answer because yeah. somebody's got a particular barrow to push themselves. Yeah. They might have a particular brick they want to sell. Yeah. Or they might have a particular. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is how we get a lot of our work handled. Uh, but, but all of us, I suppose, in, in commercial projects. Is because um, we're competing in commercial space, kind of particularly directly with you, NDYs, ACOMs, wooden grid engineers, these very large multinational engineering firms. Um, but but we are impartial and we're independent, so that's that's what really gets you. Because when you've got an engineering firm who's doing the electrical and mechanical engineering services as well as the sustainability aspects, there is that really hidden agenda in terms of. They sort of keep, give the same guy a bit of kick before each meeting. Go, shut up and let us do our thing beforehand. You know? I was going to say, yeah, even within consultants, I mean, if, um, you know, you find even people who are both passionate about sustainability, one might be pushing the solar PV barrow, and the other guy is pushing the double base we know barrow, and, and you'll you, you have a fight, or not a fight, but you'll have. A, whereas I think the nice thing with what we have here is the ability to offer architects, um, you know, marketing and sales. 
and full on engineering and life cycle assessment and, and everything in between. You know, we've got I mean, my background is in renewable energy, still a credit to the designer and installer. So you you know you leverage off a bunch of knowledge that we all sit down. And what we're doing now is offering the word that came up before, the genius bar. I'm not genius sure about bar. That, but uh, <laughs> just this design sessions. Creative but design it's sessions. We found a bar. The genius bar. <laughs> we want people to come and talk to us and, and uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. that bar. So, <laughs> You know, um, obligation-free workshops where people can come and even at pre-design concepts, you've got a bit of land maybe and you've got some financing maybe. Come and chat to us before you start coming up, you know, too far down the idea of, of, of designs because we found in projects where people will come and say, oh yeah, I did three weeks research in solar PV and, and you're like, and if you just come and talk, I could have told you that two seconds. And, and the same with, with, with what Mark does with Cundall and the same with Architecture Collective and the same with Grand Gurus. We want to give people that information, um, obviously because we love it, but number two, they go, oh wow, well, you guys are valuable. Yeah, we will bring you on board and it means that when we are brought on board, we do provide value because there's nothing worse, I find, as a consultant, we just put on a project just so that they can tick the ESD box. You know, you want to be there so that you all feel good at the end, and that's that's what we're doing. So if you know anyone with projects or anything like that you feel would fit this, um, we will be running sort of fairly regular sessions, or we're happy for people just to turn up. It's the other thing. It's pretty just much like a genius bar, right? <laughs> <laughs> In fact, it would be just the same. <laughs> You're not talking about a specific A person coming in and then everyone sitting around. You're talking about half a dozen different concepts. Totally. You know, there's obviously, yeah, there's, well, there's times where people will have confidential projects and then, yeah, they're not going to sit down and divulge all their ideas and that will be more one-on-one, -on -one, but there'll be times when it's like, oh, yeah, well, it's just all, you know, there'll be a number of people working on similar stuff. And it might be a specific question. Let's talk about solar. They can all come in and we'll talk about solar. If you've all got projects with solar that you're not sure about, we'll just go through it. Or it might be about, you know, airflow through, through open spaces and you can all come well, this is a perfect there. example. Was just just then. This, what, the reason I stuck out of the room was because Sid was grappling with a builder who was doing a DNC contract on a, <laughs> on a, on a and he was getting totally led down the guy, guy, the golden path with regards to glazing selections and expensive glasses and everything. I took one look at it and went, "That's just that's nonsense," you know. So Sid, Sid and I managed to save a builder just in that in that hour just then, x number of tens of thousands of dollars yeah. just by. Having a quick look at it there, and you know, we're able to just come up with a better glazing solution straight away. So, also probably a lesson for the builder not to employ interstate, you know, <laughs> energy <laughs> sources <laughs> who don't know the climate and the so, way things are going. Thing with, it appears a lot of the the uh, climate tools, climate correction tools, are about keeping us warmer. Yeah. For the the south of right. Canberra, you know, from Wollongong gone down, yeah. you know, the chilly part of the yeah. world, Tasmania, so forth. I don't agree with it's the, the opposite. The yeah. air conditioning is running more than. Yeah, 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 definitely, yeah. definitely. Yeah. definitely. So, so, yeah, there's a lot, lots of little tricks like that where we can uh, you know, save money if we just have a quick look at it. Yeah, that's, that's the best thing. So, we, it's always like this here where I can just walk in and have a bit of a look at something. Have you drawn sometimes? We spend more time. We do spend a lot of time to sort of to pick here, you It's not until people go home that we actually get to work Yeah, yeah. That's all part of the fun. So, uh, yeah, look, um, thanks again for coming and, and yeah, look, please drop by tomorrow if you're interested or if you, if, if you know of people that would have been interested but couldn't get here, um, send them along and, and uh, yeah, we'll to catch up. Thanks, Max. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah.